Thank you, of course, from me and Esty to Laura and Louis for once again offering their beautiful home for uh, such a special evening like this. Um, thank you not only for your hospitality tonight, but also for your persistent commitment to the arts, which we all, uh, who have known you for so many years, uh, appreciate. Um, this evening I have the honor of conversing with Esther Knobel, um, one of the most eminent Israeli jewelers, past winner of the Francois Vandenbosch Prize in the Netherlands, and also of the Andy Prize in Israel. Um, Esther, your, your practice has been referred to as, and everybody who speaks Hebrew, please forgive me, Melechet Machshevet. You're, you're doing better. Okay, good. <laughs> I Believe me, we, we rehearse Sunday morning. I have practiced this. That and the bracha over the wine is about all I know. <laughs> what does that mean in English, seriously? Well, Melechet I should say it actually started with the English. Um, I, uh, about 10 years ago, when I was uh, beginning to work on my artist book or, or right. on the process, I came across this, the term in English, the mind in the hand. I, uh, I found it in, uh, unfortunately, I, I couldn't find, refine the book at home, so I can't remember. It was a book about collecting, and I was uh, extremely touched by this simple phrasing mm -hmm. of the mind in the hand. It suddenly kind of seemed to uh, make sense of what I feel I'm doing and not being able to verbalize. And I called my friend Ora, mm -hmm. Ora Itan. She's a, a children's book illustrator and she's a very good, uh, um, she is very knowledgeable of, of, uh, uh, of language. And, uh, and, I, and I said to her, isn't it an amazing phrase? And she said, you know what it is. It, it is melechet machshevet. Melechet machshevet, you when you... Melacha, <laughs> melacha is craft, handwork. Okay. Machshava is thought. And uh, it is a biblical phrase. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I know, my, my uh, knowledge in, in the Bible, Stephen, sorry, is... Uh, limited, but for me, it is completely connected with building of, uh, with the uh, building of the portable temple. That's how I remember it. I looked it up in Wikipedia recently <laughs> and I realized it's not quite that. I mean, it's not right to put it this way, but uh, it is a very anachronistic term of describing craft. I was very kind of taken by, by uh, you know, by the, ca the comeback mm -hmm. of a, a very uh, old, old-fashioned old uh, phrase that describes craft. So that's and how I. Those pieces there really are just uh, sort of just wallpaper. Um, a little little mini survey of um, some of Esty's older pieces. You know, your work is so multivalent and deeply layered, it's deceptively simple. And I think the, the clearest approach to making your work understood this evening is to separate the threads for discussion and then kind of knit them together, much like your knitted and enameled uh, copper wire series, which, which we will see in a bit. So I think we'll start with found objects. Uh, this piece, which is an early piece from 1977 that I believe you did in London, I know is very special to you. Uh, and you expressed to me how th the idea behind it keeps resurfacing in your work throughout. Mm -hmm. do, do you want to comment about the pine needles necklace? Yeah. Uh, I consider it to be my, uh, my first real piece of jewelry, although I, I've made uh, quite a few pieces before that. I, I trained at Bezalel and then I went to the uh, Royal College and uh, that was one of my uh, graduation pieces there. Um, it really is a copy of a 
piece we used to make, well, a piece of jewelry we used to make as children under the pine trees. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the pine needles, they have like two needles in one pocket. Right. So we would pull one needle. I, I'm explaining because I know not everywhere uh, children uh, have the same tradition, but I know in the uh, Middle East turn countries, mm -hmm. uh, this is recognizable. So we used to like pull one needle and then push the, the end of the other, the one that is left into, uh, into the pocket to make a loop and then make a chain. I actually, I actually went on Wikipedia today to see what pine needles looked like. I, 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 thought, I <laughs> thought I knew. Uh, you know, the challenge was to try and make, to recreate uh, this childhood memory of, uh, uh, <clears throat> of my uh, precious uh, first necklace. And, um, uh, and then I, I could kind of use uh, alum uh, different facilities of coloring metal. That was what I was interested in at the time. So, you know, uh, in, in studying Esty's work for, for this presentation, she is very object oriented. Am I right in saying mm -hmm. that? Whether, whether the objects are actually appropriated and used um, in their either entirety or in part in a piece, or whether they have in fact just inspired um, a direction. Uh -huh. um, I think one of, one of the overriding characteristics is that they are so object-oriented. The ready-mades um, are, are, again, either a source of inspiration or also uh, appropriated into the work. Um, can you tell us what attracts you to what's, and I'm gonna, I, I added something after we spoke, lost, abandoned, or simply borrowed? And you know, mm. what, what is it that, it, what is it Well, that I, I need an object to make an object. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I can't, if I don't have something to start from, something visual, I, I can't work. So uh, you this know, the, is- The piece that I wanted to draw attention to is the gold piece that is kind of a third of the way over that gold color mm -hmm. piece, which um, that's an infantry emblem that was run through a die press and that reminded you of the Cedars of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. uh, and then next to it and a, like diagonally opposite, there are three total found objects which are copper talisman No, they are not all. No. The middle one is, uh, is some one I made. Right. Okay, why don't you talk about those? When I uh, received the Andy Prize for the exhibition, I uh, decided to edit my work in a way that you, to, to blur between the, the, the actual pieces that I, I, right. I made and the found object. So I was just kind of pulling uh, stuff from my drawers and it all consisted of things I bought, things I found on the ground, things I never finished. And this kind of uh, blur is, is a place that I like to be in, is actually about uh, not distinguishing between a uh, found things, uh, artwork that is a part of the process mm -hmm. and finished pieces. I mean, it were also the exhibition was constructed this way. But uh, to, uh, I mean, we could talk about it mm -hmm. for days. I mean, uh, why anyone is choosing to recycle and uh, not start off from the blank page. And this necklace is made from recycled, parts of recycled drinking cans, right? To yeah, bottle but, caps. but the cups, the, the bottle cups are, are completely handmade. I, I just to say one or two words about, uh, about this attitude of uh, holding on to uh, found objects or uh, it's very much uh, related to my upbringing. I mm -hmm. mean, when I became committed to making jewelry, mm -hmm. it was the time uh, jewelry was being questioned and redefined. And uh, it was like the late, late 70s, uh, beginning of the 80s. We were looking for new materials to, mm -hmm. um, to uh, define preciousness, to uh, question preciousness. And uh, being me, I went, uh, you know, to the very extreme, and I've been always doing that ever since. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my work was uh, was always in non-precious materials. Uh, 
And probably personality thing. Some people, you know, can just imagine, visualize. Mm -hmm. I don't visualize. I have to see something to I get that's going. That's probably why you're so object, you know, maybe object oriented. Um, because I start from an object. You start from an object. Mm -hmm. You know, although your, your output isn't really thematic, there are certainly certain emotional, societal, and technical categories, mm -hmm. uh, often interrelated, mm -hmm. actually always probably interrelated, uh, that consistently reappear. Um, and you possess an admirable ability to combine humor and pathos, playfulness and fortitude, resignation and hope. And with that in mind, let's look at some of the, some of the um, I think, most potent pieces. So family, I, I think, is one theme that you certainly deal with. Uh, and could you talk about those hand pieces? Yeah, I, I kind of draw from life. Uh, because I, be, I kind of see jewelry as, as my, my language, I, an artistic way of expressing myself or way of expressing myself without artistic. Um, so these are pieces from the late 80s, I think. And they're not jewelry pieces, they're kind of rings or hand pieces. Um, they, um, are inspired by photographs, looking at, at photographs. So you have a photograph in your hand. And uh, the left one is a depiction of a, a picture of my son, Jonathan, when he was a baby. And it's, uh, you, it's called Prince, right? The Prince, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the right one, of course, is the mother. And, uh, and they, are, uh, they take from tin toys. Mm -hmm. They have movement in them. Uh, they kind of redefine what a ring would be. Like normally you would re wear a ring on, the, on, on the front of your hand. This is a ring for the... For the inside. Actually, I think I read somewhere you were saying how you carry this through life. You know, you, you, the hand piece, you carry the piece with you mm -hmm. as you would carry your family. This one is particularly fascinating because this shows the photo that inspired the brooch. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I uh, like this photo so much, I made a, a piece of, uh, of, it's something between a toy and a brooch made in uh, nickel silver mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's called Rabbit in Pram. It, uh, it has, it again has movement, it has a, a pin at the back. Yeah, it is a brooch. Um, uh, a sort of a sort of a brooch toy, and a completely different technique. Um, my grandmother is knitting too. Um, th the process now. I, I I hope you can all see. These pieces are actually knit. Um, and describe the process by which you knit this because it's fascinating. It's copper wire. Um, I, um, I, maybe it is, uh, you know, in, interesting to mention that uh, my mother uh, uh, died at around that time. Uh, uh, when she was ill, I was uh, with her in the hospital and I needed to do something. Mm -hmm. So I brought some of this. It's telephone wire that I, I would pick up from uh, the streets, I mean, uh, in Israel, where, where, where they have these tele street telephone boxes, and they, uh, when they have excess wire and they have nothing to do with it, and, you know, we don't do very well with uh, putting our rubbish away, so they would just drop it next mm -hmm. to the box, and I would collect it. And I knitted it. It has copper wire inside it. And uh, so, you know, I would knit the, the, this plastic uh, coated copper wire into images. I'm not a big knitter, but, uh, you know, it was like practicing knitting. And then I uh, burnt the plastic out and, uh, uh, and enameled it. So, right. so the plastic was burned, you know, you, we've all seen telephone wire. The plastic was burned off after after SD knit the forms and then the color was derived from enamel. 
It's not only the color, it's also the, I mean, <coughs> uh, knitting should be soft, but mm -hmm. in, in enamel is kind of hard. hard and brittle. Uh, so it was like looking very soft, but yeah. kind of surprisingly not, not nice to hold. It's also brittle. It's yeah. kind of, it, it, it sort of is slightly falling apart with time. And the, and the installation is, uh, is also a, a sort of re bringing back a childhood memory. It's a little kit of a girl with a teddy bear and a brooch and my pliers, which I knitted the handles for, and, uh, and some little brooches and a, a timble. So just a, a silly think, little kid. I think that the series is just a wonderful example of, you know, Esty's commitment to family and then this um, invention of new techniques to depict um, these uh, very potent subjects, but also humorous, um, light subjects, and, <laughs> and, to, and to integrate them all, which is, I think, really one of the brilliances. This ambivalence is, is uh, very strong in my work. I mean, I, I kind of touch uh, uh, traumatic and sad uh, subjects, but then uh, uh, very often I kind of try to to be playful about it, not to get too heavy. So it's, it's always this kind of gentle balance mm -hmm. between. Uh, and I think as we look at, the, at, at all of her series, we're going to see this coming up in, in different manifestations. Um, nature is another one of Esty's um, big, big influences. Flora Palestina, which was a large series. I'm, I'm actually wearing a brooch. That you, that you gave me, <laughs> thank you, Good for me. From, yeah, from this series. Tell us, what does Flora Palestina mean? Well, uh, Flora Palestina you know. means what it sounds. Flora is the flowers and Palestina is Palestine. Oh, mm -hmm. So it's the flowers of Palestine. Um, when, 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 I, when Israel was formed, I mean, the, uh, some, some professional people like the uh, botanists were, uh, were trying to define Israel through its, uh, its flora, its flowers. In my very young days, when I was a young student at the Bezalel, mm -hmm. I was working for Professor Zohari, who is uh, the um, uh, expert, was, I mean, he's, he's dead by now, but he was the expert on uh, the flora of Israel, he wrote all the flowers dictionary. So I had a special bond. I was drawing and copying uh, images for his books. And uh, I myself uh, studied biology as, uh, in high school. I thought I would become a biologist, mm -hmm. actually. I loved flowers, I still do. So uh, the, all these kind of facts were combined and, you know, deserves being uh, a, a set in a piece of jewelry. Um, and those are all rings, which is um, pretty amazing. They're, uh, well, they're they are most, I call them more studies for rings. Mm -hmm. They're quite flat. They're something in between uh, um, uh, drawings and, and objects. Um, it's interesting to mention, I mean, we are not talking about politics today, but mm -hmm. uh, um, Flora Palestina, uh, I mean, flowers of Palestine were uh, represented on postcards and Israeli souvenirs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the early days, in the 50s. I mean, not anymore, but if you walk around antique shops, you can still find cards that have uh, fl uh, leaves and... Uh, uh, fabricated kind of different sh flower shapes uh, stuck onto them. So that was another inspiration, just uh, antique old objects and, uh, and the whole notion of uh, Israel and Palestine. And, and these baskets now, it's the same basket, right? This is the same, uh, the structure is the same. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, the difference is in the decoration. So, I mean, uh, you have to believe me, but, uh, but you can probably, if you look well, you can see it. Uh, it's, it's the same basket. We only just changed f uh, 
the decoration from rose, uh, dried roses to hot peppers. <laughs> uh, uh, you can do anything with it. I mean, uh, it's kind of uh, an approach to uh, involve the uh, owner in, in uh, doing the decoration. And it relates to a tradition uh, that we have in Israel uh, in the harvest ceremony, that's mm -hmm. in uh, the late spring. We, as children, used to take baskets with, uh, with uh, vegetables and fruits and uh, good things to the, to the school as offerings. Right. And, uh, you know, in the 50s, we had nothing, so we would recycle shoe bag. My mother would take a, an old shoe box and make it into a, a basket just right. and wow. decorate it. So that, that is the memory. <laughs> Remembrance also and, and grief are, are themes that you have embraced. Um, tell us about the train, because this is, this is a necklace which I think has many, many layers of meaning. Mm. Um, it, you know, it looks like a toy train, but I, I think it's far more than that. And by the way, it is in the permanent collection of the Stedelijk Museum in, in Amsterdam. Um, yeah, this is a kind of outstanding piece. I normally make my work in series, so mm -hmm. there is more than one. There is nothing like this. I've never made anything like it uh, before or after. You can relate it a little bit to the snake uh, right. the series. Snake, that's in Montreal. It's, uh, yeah. it's uh, chronologically and also technically very related, but it, it came before the snakes. Mm -hmm. so it's a kind of Wagnerian piece, very kind of uh, heavy and uh, um, I get, I, when, I fi when I made it, you know, and thinking about this train going around your neck, I mean, it, it is a like Holocaust a piece. It looks like, that, that's, that, that's the, you know, the, the, this, this dichotomy that, that, you know, I'm trying to illustrate in Estes' work. I mean, it looks like a toy. But it certainly has references to the Holocaust. Also, it's a choker, and it's real. I mean, it looks like it could really choke you. It doesn't seem to have any beginning or end. Yeah. So it's this, you know, this juxtaposition of, um, <coughs> of seriousness and levity. Mm -hmm. um, it's weird psychology. I, I, I am not qualified to yeah. talk about it, but. Uh, uh, I mean, this kind of very colorful uh, period, and then this came, so. So these, the Requiem pieces, these are from 1994, this, mm -hmm. this is later. So this is a series of pendant objects. Yeah, bo they're, they're box pendants or object pendants. Um, just replete with meaning. I mean, can you address these for, a, for you know? Yeah, it's kind of, uh, you know, sad to see these pieces follow each other. Yeah, later on, uh, Sandy is wearing uh, a, yes. the, the later version on with the his, enamel. Uh, yes. And that's, that is really a, a, a take on Monk. Mm -hmm. um, what does the string represent that's covering the eyes of the... Uh, of that the came house? later. Actually, I mean, what I did in these pieces was was uh, imitate the, uh, or copy the, the structure of a matchbox. Right. I just, uh, it's so it's a, like a little drawer that you can store things in it and... Uh, Matchboxes also can burn when you like Probably, to yeah. And the, and the string, I was, uh, I, I meant to hang them, but uh, be, because I wanted them to be a group, I mean, I called them Requiem and I, uh, imagine them uh, uh, singing a requiem. Uh, it was handy to uh, wrap the, the thread around the box just to keep it, uh, uh, you know, tidy. And then I thought they actually uh, are kind of masks for the eyes. Right. So, so the piece, uh, pieces sometimes grow, evolve yeah. in the making. So, and ideas uh, become kind of more. Uh, more evident as I go along. Well, this one, the, the, the um, matchboxes with the little knit hats. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that was uh, yeah, uh, trying to, uh, t 
to uh, give them some kind of healing, you know, they were right. so troubled. The healing were, is also something that I found to, to run through Esty's work. Uh, we're going to see a few more pieces that I, that I thought were on that theme as well. Um, and then there are the, the, what I call the humorous humans. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, the sportsmen. Mm -hmm. Now this is an earlier piece from a decade before mm. the, um, the Requiem pieces that we saw. So there, um, who, uh, what, what famous, you told me there was a famous film director. Busby uh, Berkeley. Busby Berkeley. So these, these were inspired by Busby Berkeley. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're painted tin. This piece actually is in the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. Incidentally, Esty's work is in so many major museums around the world. Um, you know, if you look at her resume, it's, it's, it's mind-bogglingly mind impressive. And um, the Warriors um, also painted tin, interesting in many ways. These, you told me, were influenced by David Hockney, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, actually, I, I saw a show of David Hockney today, yeah. which is kind of uh, funny. That's interesting. That's um, uh, well, the, the color scheme is mm -hmm. more. I, I was sitting with David Hockney, paints the stage uh, when I was making them. I think it's, it's interesting to, s to look at them in relationship to the time they were made. And, uh, yeah, this is 83 days. I, I, you know, I was living in Israel and looking at work that was made in Europe and I had a dialogue. I think I was responding to this kind of uh, uh, abstract uh, nature of the jewelry that was going on in, in Holland, for instance, at that time. And I thought, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, destroy the party a little bit. You know, that was my thing of, uh, you know, I had enough distance to, uh, to make comments. So I, I came up with this super figurative mm -hmm. uh, um, imagery that was not at all uh, accepted at that time. And, uh, but in the in the Busby Berkeley series, Busby Berkeley uh, inspiration, uh, I sort of played between the figurative and the abstract because right. the repetition created the sort yes, of abstract sort of a pattern, sort of like a yeah mm -hmm. an abstract pattern. What's brilliant about these also is the these are brooches mm -hmm. and the closure. Yeah, so this was another thing that was uh, happening at that period and my work is very much in dialogue with, with the jewelry of the time. Uh, pieces, you know, in America you sometimes talk about sculpture for the body. Right. So a, a piece has a dead side to it, which is the side of the brooch. But we, um, we, we believe jewelry should be three-dimensional and, uh, and you, you shouldn't, uh, you know, uh, prefer the front mm -hmm. to the back. So these pieces were, and, and a lot of my pieces became toy-like because I wanted to uh, uh, make a point of the three-dimensionality of it. And also so, the way it closes, it closes yeah. with, the, with the bow. Yeah, so the I arrow. actually redefined the, the, the brooch. And the, the same with the Immigrant series, mm -hmm. which um, it's clo the closure is through the sort of the pole that's holding up the flag. Um, but the Immigrant series also uh, very lighthearted um, comment on, on, on immigration. Mm -hmm and the, 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 fun of, um, the fun of immigration. And then I started, uh, I liked it, and I thought it's a good idea. I mean, you didn't mention the, the red wire is a rubber, a rubber band, mm -hmm. and the, the, this is really giving the tension to the piece. So it's part of the decoration, but it is also part of the structure. And what are the images from? So the, the right image is a found object. So I bought it in a shop. In, mm -hmm. We had this antique shop that had all these uh, peculiar uh, bits and pieces which I could recycle, and I had a few of them. And then when I was running out of them, I started looking, and then I found the China tea boxes. Mm -hmm. So I was just stealing the images of the tea boxes, like cutting them out and... Uh, 
and, and putting them into my work. So part is handmade, but I, again, I, I kind of tend to blur. I don't want you to know which, which is made by, him, by me and which is stolen yeah, that's a, from. That's actually an important point. It is this sort of blend of the, of the actual found object, the appropriated object, and Estes um, handmade version um, of that object. So the wheels are, oh. are completely handmade. The targets is a fascinating piece. Also part of the, the, yeah. the box I, I take it yeah. is a found object. It's a, no, no, the box. You made was the box? Alex made the box. Alex made the box. Alex made the box oh. for me and I think he also painted it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, at one point I decided the jewelry doesn't have to be wearable, it can be uh, carryable. Right, you know. as the hand, hand pieces. Ted Norton, for instance, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I made a, a kind of showcase, mm -hmm. but the showcase was designed to, uh, to, to, uh, to the objects that were made, and the objects are inspired by, uh, by weights. You, you remember the old uh, scales? Mm -hmm. They had weights, and they, they differed in, in height. And in Hebrew, uh, this piece is called matarot, Matarot is a, a target, but it also is a, something to aim for. It it's kind of has a double meaning, and I played with this double meaning. It's not working in English, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's very strong. It's lost Hebrew in translation. Is a, it lost in translation, <laughs> exactly. So uh, I sort of played again with this ambivalence between something positive to mm -hmm. aim for and a, and the target that you would shoot. In so a shoe, like in a shooting gallery. And it's a work about, it work about the aggression and, uh, and using excess force mm -hmm. and so on. So the mind in the hand is a series, um, you know, going back to Melechet Machshevet, <laughs> going back to that. The mind in the hand is a series which, which was, um, so um, so unique and nothing like anybody else ever attempted in metalwork. Uh, this is an etching. Can you explain how you achieved this etching? Mm -hmm. I tend in the last years, or actually for a while, for many years already, to, uh, to visit other disciplines because I uh, kind of think they are all related. So. Uh, I've done ceramics, I, I've recently been casting iron, uh, uh, and I was, uh, I took a class in printmaking. We have a, a lovely print workshop in Jerusalem, so I learned how to do traditional etching. And then uh, when I was going on my own, I uh, of course decided I have to reinvent uh, the wheel. Uh, the wheel. <laughs> so, and being a jeweler, et the etching techniques are very much related because it's mostly done on metal. So, and I was using embossing and pressing, uh, you know, all through my career. Mm -hmm. So, and I was also always interested in the wrong side of things. I mean, I don't know, um, I don't feel that I can say that something is right. So I, you know, I, I intend to do something and then I look at the back and I think, wow, it's a lot better. So my intentions are never, uh, I can't really trust my intentions. So I was fascinated by the idea of uh, putting the right and the wrong side of embroidery together. Because mm -hmm. normally you just, you see them e either, either side. You right, cannot see them the simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I, um, embro I, I perforated a, a piece of alu aluminum. Uh, I drew on it and then, then perforated the lines so I can uh, stitch them with uh, binding iron wire. And then I embossed it into a folded piece of aluminum, which you can see here, it, and opened it after pressing it through the rolling mill, so I got the imprint of my stitching and I printed it, so that's the result on paper. And this, this was extended 
to jewelry. Uh -huh. So this piece is embroidered, it's silver, embroidered with the iron wire. Uh -huh. I, didn't, I didn't mean to make jewelry with this series. It was just uh, playing with, with all the artwork. I, uh, I realized that when I put it through the uh, rolling mill, the, the iron, which is a lot harder than the aluminum, will, will sink into the aluminum and it will become like an inlay. I right. mean, uh, in the past days, uh, people used to kind of slave to get this kind mm -hmm. of uh, effect. And I am thrilled by being able to in reinvent inlay. So I started making these uh, embroidered uh, silver pieces and, uh, and they are something between inlay and free drawing. So if it's free drawing, then, uh, you know, I can do, uh, uh, you know, just erase places. So that's what I do to them now. I kind of uh, re-visit re, uh, them. Revisit and them and rework them. Rework but, them. you know, it, the, the, the wonderful thing about the series is that it's not just about tools and working and labor and machinery, but Esty also has done these beautiful, poignant, um, like the, this woman praying, uh, in, this, in this embroidery of uh, iron wire on silver technique. Um, I, had, I had started our conversation by saying that I saw Esty last fall before she was going to this residency uh, at, at the Kohler um, fixture uh, company. Explain how hard it is for people who don't really know enameling to enamel on cast iron. On cast iron. Actually, I mean, I, I, I was only there for two months and uh, I, uh, I couldn't do it myself. I mean, it is a very kind of skillful um, uh, activity because they, they enamel uh, um, hot iron. So yeah, they have to... Yeah, it has to, to be red hot, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you would, uh, you, I would like, you know, kill myself right away. <laughs> so, I, I mean... Basically, I, I only, uh, in the, on the left piece, uh, I made the molds for the beads and uh, it's not a very good slight or the light is not good enough to see how bad the beads look because I, I didn't know how to do it. It took me a while to master it. So this necklace is really the, um, the diary of me uh, learning how to make a bead and cast iron and the, then the guys would enamel it for me. I couldn't open the kiln because uh, it's not allowed. And then uh, I, I really insisted on, uh, on being able to do something mm -hmm. myself because I, I came to call her to enamel. That was my passion and I realized I couldn't do it. So I, I uh, suggested that I will decorate the overglaze, the, the enamel with, uh, with decals. And they said, that you can't do that. We've never done something like this. It, does, it will not work. And uh, I, uh, I insisted. And eventually, I, I, uh, sh they, they gave me things to, uh, to decorate because they, they saw it was working. We talk so much now, we have for the past few decades, about, about quote, art and craft. But, um, and at, you know, at a time when this theoretical discourse on the very definition of art, craft, jewelry still plagues us, um, you don't appear to be conflicted. And no, I don't I, think you should be. I know. <laughs> <laughs> on the occasion of your solo exhibition, Long Distance Runner, which mm -hmm. was awarded to you um, as, as part of the Andrea Bronfman Prize for the Arts, which was held at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art in 2008, mm -hmm. uh, the late Mordechai Omer, who was then the director and chief curator of the museum, lab labeled your output, quote, an encounter between art and craft in his preface to the accompanying catalog. Elizabeth Denbeston states that your use of knitting and embroidery, and I might add the idea of memory vessels, your most recent work, offers an insider's statement about crafts 
That is, and I'm still quoting Elizabeth Dembeston, the charm of the imperfect object and the directness of the imagery. And the comment on the current practice of placing handicrafts or DIY, do it yourself, along with studio craft work within the world of art and design. So your most recent work, um, uh, this is a box from uh, the Memory Vessel series, which um, is part of an exhibition which just opened on Saturday at Gallery Loop of um, Esty's most recent work, and the, the exhibition is called Memory Vessel. Um, and the process behind this box so encapsulates, I think, so much of what you've been doing in that you've electroformed, what have you electroformed to make that? Just a box with, uh, with uh, bits what? of things I collect from the, from the street. I don't know if any of you are familiar with um, memory jugs. It's sort of a folk art form. People, um, it, it's, it's a DIY thing. People would take in the late 19th and 20th century up to like the 1930s, 40s, they would take a jug or a jar of any kind and they would put cement on it and they would embed within the cement memorabilia, things that meant things to them, buttons, uh, sequins, photographs, bits of jewelry. Are, are you mostly familiar? I can see you people don't go to the pier show. <laughs> or, or you would... <laughs> Or you would all, those who are laughing I know have been to the Pierce show, or you would see memory jugs. So this I think is kind of a modern um, take on that concept of these objects, these small objects. We can see snappers and safety pins and that, that Esty has, she's told me this had, was a, a sorry, if this is not a sardine can, can you explain what electroforming is for a minute? For electroforming is, a, is a, a slightly thicker coat of uh, metal than just uh, 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 plating. It's a kind of a plate, form of plating. I'm not sure uh, uh, about the technological uh, aspects because I don't uh, do it myself. But it's a, a coat of, of copper, silver, gold, whatever you choose, that uh, will, be, will cover the object. And uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I use a factory to do that. And the, 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 they are doing me a favor, more or less, that they have patience for the nonsense I ask them to do, because the, their regular uh, income is from uh, make-believe objects right. of uh, souvenirs and all sorts of kitsch uh, stuff, uh, you know, that you buy in Ben Yehuda Street in Jerusalem. Or at the pier in New York. Yeah. <laughs> the, the pier but it also is very much related to outsider art. Yes, I think absolutely. I mean. Outsider art, folk art. What Esty does is she is kind of making an amalgamation between um, between art, craft, and do it yourself, you know, happy hands at home, which um, with, with great aplomb, I have to say. So okay. can you speak about, is that a sardine? The can? right, uh, re, the red box is a sardine can. Yeah, got the sardine. Uh, <laughs> What's so, it filled with? I love sardines uh, and I'm hungry, so that's just. <laughs> <laughs> it's filled with, uh, with some of my jewelry uh -huh. and uh, yeah not not all of it is jewelry because i didn't want it to be too heavy so mm -hmm. so i made and that's uh, a pendant sd right well uh, uh, yeah i it i saw it on uh, susan susan was wearing yeah. uh, a version of it and i was surprised to see that on the right person it looks good Yes, definitely. And the, the necklace on the left? The necklace is, uh, is just the first one uh, of this series of beaded necklaces that uh, are completely hand fabricated. No electroforming there. Electroforming is a very uh, painful process and uh, I thought it will all be very easy, but uh, it turned out to be uh, almost 
you know, uh, uh, taking a life risk to make these pieces. So I think uh, I'm going to slow down. Yeah. Um, and these are magnets brooches. Yeah. Also, here you can really see the found objects mm -hmm. embedded, the safety pin, the needles. Um, yeah. So this is a slightly earlier version where I was like trying out the idea. I, I like these pieces personally very much. Uh, they're not big or, or, or uh, you know, Diverse outstanding, but, uh, but they are, uh, I, I, in a way, I mean, I think they are good, uh, good, good works. And, uh, and it's just a piece of wax that I, uh, um, I covered with, with found objects, electroformed, got, uh, melted the wax out and enameled. Yeah. And very, very close to the idea of the memory jug. And every, I think every good lecture should end with Mickey, <laughs> if you can see Mickey's head up there in the car. That's a toy, isn't it, that you will look Yeah, well, that's the it's back. A it's the back of the toy. The, the silhouette is a silhouette of a toy, and the, uh, the, on the other side is the, the you back. have the other image? That's the last yeah, one? No. That, not, that's it. Okay. I, I thought it was the front. No, but you so know what? To, to that piece's credit, the back is as good as the front. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Thank you.